Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. You know, I want to start the video today with a shout out to the CNC Cookbook. They were nice enough to contact me recently. We had some dialogue going. So Mr. Bob Warfield and the CNC Cookbook, this is a website and a blog dedicated to make you a better CNC er tooling, awareness speeds, feeds, tricks, uh, and a lot of the material presented on this blog and this website is cross compatible with manual machining too. So thanks Bob for the shout out and go see CNC Cookbook, cnccookbook.com. Not compensated. Question, two part video today. First part is I have an existing thread. I don't know what size to bore the mating component before I run the internal thread to put that on. That is done exactly like the tap formula. Major diameter minus the pitch value is the whole size. Same thing with an OD thread that you are going to turn single point inside. Take the OD of the thread, subtract the pitch value, and that will give you the bore of the mating part. Determine the pitch value however you need to. Uh, the way I do it, if I don't already know what the part is by having a print of the part, you can use a pitch gauge like this one. Now do be careful if you evaluate a physical thread with a gauge like that and you don't have a long stretch of engagement to check because there are some metric and imperial threads that overlap close enough that the mating part will go on. It's like, well, i got to take another five because it hangs up when it's a half an inch on. You take another five and it goes another quarter of an inch. You take another five and before you know it, it's bouncing around and it still doesn't go on. That's well because it's metric or imperial and the mating part is not compatible. Keep that in mind. OD of the blank or OD of the part that has the thread already on it minus the distance between the pitch equals the bore diameter. Simple, works every time. The other question that I see and that I've received is can you invent your own thread? Can you just come up with some random size OD and thread it and make a nut and will it work? And the answer is absolutely yes you can. At the end of this video I will put two thread wire charts, still frames. So you can pause them, you can copy the screen, print it out, whatever. But for the sake of this next demonstration, it would be nice if you had one of those in your face so you could see exactly what I'm talking about. Now to inspect the thread with thread wires, one wire, three wires, uh, you can inspect a radial undercut with two wires, but an OD thread you can do it with one or two, or excuse me, one or three. The chart has what's called an add value and a constant value. The add value is the value that you add to the nominal major diameter of the thread. Let's say it's a one inch thread. Let's just for yucks. One inch OD. The add value is going to be much smaller than the constant value. So the add value is the number that you add to the diameter. One inch OD plus the add value. And that is going to be the dimension that you're going to look for when you use the wire that they recommend based on your pitch to come up with that measurement. Okay? So if this is one inch and the add value, let's say is 070. got to get a big shell. 1 inch OD plus the add value of 070 is now 1.07. That would be the number that you are looking to find when you put your micrometer across that thread using the wires from the chart. That's what you find. Now how do you find exactly what the pitch diameter is that you have found? All you have is a reference. The pitch diameter is now, take the 1 inch 070, or whatever you have, minus the constant. And 
and that will give you the pitch diameter. These charts, I have double checked and triple checked the values in these charts, and they will put you just shy of nominal for like a class 2 fit. Now, forgive me with my metrics, I can't tell you what, what classification that is comparably, but Imperial, it's right just below the midpoint of a class 2. So, the add of the constant values of the charts in the end of this video are incredibly valuable for just that. I would suggest take a screenshot, print it out, put it in your toolbox, and if you don't have wires, get wires. Keep that trick in mind for figuring out what the bore is, and as far as creating your own thread, adds in constants all day long. And once you've created that OD thread or that ID thread, because you can calculate it the same way, you're golden. Got a job I got to do. I'm going to probably film some of it, show you how I do it, and uh, we'll get to it. Let's take a look. Because I want this demonstration to be what they call a proprietary thread, I am going to pick a thread that's not in the book. You can see that up in the inch and a half, two inch range, it jumps one sixteenth of an inch in between major diameters of the thread. 687, 750, 625, so it's every one sixteenth increments on the growth of the major diameter of the thread. Knowing that, let's pick something wild. Let's go with a, oh, let's move over here. Let's go one point, how about 710? That's bizarre enough, right? 1 inch 710 OD and 12 TPI. That thread does not exist. Now you can see that in this book right here, this is the machinery handbook. If you do not have one of these books, it's going to set you back a couple dollars, but you got to get one because if you're going to take any part of your shop seriously, you got to have access to data like this. Gives you the class, one, two, and three. One is sloppy, two is normal, three is like an instrument. It tells you what the fit is in between the male and the female threads. It gives you the allowable deviation from the max diameter, pitch diameter, minor diameter, that would be the root, and it gives you these values for the external and the internal. So this is a very handy thing to have. If you're going to use something like this, well, it's probably a good idea that you have hard gauges or wires. And that's where our wires come in handy. Let's take a look at that. Thread wires. Easily acquired here in the USA. I know that some of you guys in the UK and Australia and such have a hard time getting these. If you cannot get them and you're willing to bite the bullet on the postage, I'd be happy to send you some. Give me, a, give me a shout out and we'll see if we can make that happen. All right, back to that little chart. This is the chart that's going to be at the end of the book or at the end of the video. For 12 threads per inch, right here in the first column, 12 threads per inch, find it. There you go. 55 value is the wire size. So we're going to pull the 055 wires out of that kit. And here's the two values that I spoke about inside. One is an add value and one is a constant value. Add and constant. So those are right there, so I must be right. When you go for the major diameter of the thread, 1 inch 710, right? You're going to take the add value in this column right here and you're going to add it to that 1 inch 710. Do that. When you add the add value to the diameter of the thread that you want to create, here's the diameter of the thread that we want to create. That's the add value from the chart. This is now your measurement across three O fifty five diameter wires. Now, if you've watched my other threading videos, you know you can set a tool with two wires, you can measure with one or three. And for sake of convention and so that I don't confuse anybody, I will use the three. But I will put the link to that video in here because it's good to have options, right? So let's do that. 1 inch 710 on the major diameter of the thread, that's the OD, 12 threads per inch. I am going to cut the external thread first. Let's take a look at the setup on the machine. 
Now for all you guys that are freaking out and saying, dear God, why is this compound set this way? I plunge my threads. This machine is rigid enough and I tooling that I use, the inserts are ground so that on a thread this size I can do that. So I will not be using the compound for this. I will dial this thread in exclusively using the cross slide. Why is it set up at 45? Well when I bring the cross slide all the way back, this dial will never interfere with this dial. So I don't leave it set at a very mild angle. The 45 degree also allows the tailstock to come in and not bump into anything. This will never encounter the front of my tailstock here. So if you leave this set perpendicular to the cross slide, sooner or later you're going to encounter a situation where you just don't have enough reach on your tailstock to accommodate your thread. Let's put the part in here, turn the OD down to 1 inch 710, run a 12 pitch thread on it. Now located somewhere on the face of your machine you're going to have a chart like this one on the front of my closing here. And these charts will tell you how to set all your levers and dials and buttons and switches to accommodate what you're trying to accomplish. A lot of these newer machines, or a lot of the more current machines, will have some type of international graphic on it showing this one here is a thread. And then there's feeds, metric, inches. For this demonstration, we're going to go with the 12, which is the top LB6T. Now, the machine has two, high, two ranges, high range, low range. That's the L. Make sure all the gears in your headstock are set accordingly to the L configuration. The B, you have an ABC lever here. Make sure that the lever's in the B. The gearbox is on selection number six. You are over in the T, and all threads on this machine are run in the V selection. There's your V right there, and there are the other four options for the 12-pitch thread. I'm going to see if I can run this successfully at around 570 RPM. If that dial is spinning too fast and I'm just not comfortable with the engagement, I'll slow it down. I will have my tool inverted. I will be threading from left to right, and if you have a screw-on chuck, make sure that chuck is keyed. And it's a screw-on collar. If it is strictly screwed on, check with the manufacturer and make sure to uh, follow their recommendations on running that machine in reverse under load. All right, let's test it out. I've elected to go with 425 RPM for this particular thread. And if you haven't watched the video I have posted on engaging a half nut made easier, you might want to refer to that. I've got my dial all marked up. All the black lines are factory lines, and the majority of the bright red lines are in between lines. Those are the ones you want to avoid if you want a successful outcome here. So, for a 12 pitch thread, I can use any of the black eight positions, any of them. If you're scared, by all means, put a star on one of the lines and use that number exclusively. First part of the demonstration, let's turn this down to 1 inch 710 on the outside. OD 1 inch 708. Setting the height of an inverted tool is just as easy as setting one that's conventionally positioned. Just adjust the height until it clears your standard by minimal amount. Minimal. On an insert like this, it is not a good idea to drop it down onto the standard and lock the tool post that have a 
big chance of cracking the insert. Lower it and feed it. As long as the standard doesn't move, we're good. I'll take it right there. Now I am not going to do undercuts on the cap and the arbor that I'm making for two reasons. When I plunge the tool in the back here, I'm going to get a radial groove around this part that is slightly off of this shoulder. To accommodate for that on the cap, I am going to put a small board lead so the cap can butt up against the shoulder. Same thing for this external thread to the internal thread. The internal thread will have the same configuration, just internally. So I'm going to put a small lead on the face of this as well so that the external thread can clear the internal lack of threaded area. I, it'll make sense when it's all done. Let's run the thread on there and I'll show you the specs as they develop. Okay, at this point in time, this thread has been done exclusively by eye. You don't want to check it too soon because the wires will sit real high and it'll just be a pain in the neck. So I've been watching the crest of the thread up here, and it's a, it's a minimal flat at this point, and I trust that the wires will sit in there real nice. You don't want that to be razor sharp, so as you're progressing with a thread like this, or any thread for that matter, when you start seeing those crests get a little bit thin, it's time to check them. Let's see what we get with the wires. Feel the micrometer sit over the three point contact and just rock it back and forth and walk it until you're content. I think we're looking at around one inch 776. So let's do the math from the value on the page one inch 776. Okay, the numbers tell me we are 28 thousandths away. I'm going to go 25 and check it. If you're going to deburr a thread, get in the habit of deburring a thread while it's running forward and reverse. If there's any fibers, any hairs, any burrs on that thread that laid down, when you reverse it and deburr it, they will stand back up and come off. You don't want to find that out when you're test fitting the component and when you go to reverse the thread to take the components apart. Then they stand up and that's when it locks. <laughs>
You can see how the crest of the thread is a lot pointier now that you're closer to your final size. Good indicator that you're getting close. Looking for 1 inch 748. That would be perfect. Seven fifty two and a half. Four and a half more and we are golden. I'm gonna call it four and a half more. I will deeper this thread. I will take one additional finish pass to remove anything that I may have rolled over from the deburring process. When you position the wires, make sure that the wire that's opposed originates in the same track as one of the other ones so that it puts you in the triangle. You don't want to be outside of that. It'll make your mic reading wrong. One seven forty seven. It is a thou under. That is okay. You pretty much rely on the fact that you have about two, two and a half thou on either side of the number that the chart is going to give you. I'm going to relieve a lot of the front of this thread so that it fits in the cap. The cap will not have an undercut. Alright, 1 inch 710 12 pitch thread per the spec. If you wanted to find out what the pitch diameter was, naturally back out the constant from the wire measurement. In order to bore the cap successfully, I'm going to take the 1 inch 710 and I'm going to divide 1 inch by 12 to give me the crest to crest value. I will subtract that value from this size and that will give me the bore. Let's take this out, make the cap. Moving on to the cap, we have a 12 pitch thread. So one inch divided by 12 gives us 0.833 between Pitches, major diameter of the thread that we just cut. This is the blank before it's threaded. Major diameter minus this pitch value gives us the bore size. This is our target diameter bore. I'm going to face that cap off and we're going to bore it out to this diameter. Then we're going to thread it. I am going to bore the cap ten thousandths deeper than the length of the external thread. Let's get after it. Going to start the machining of the cap with a nice face cut so we have a reference for all the other features. 
This is two inch diameter 6061 aluminum. This is a 31 millimeter diameter drill, one inch 218 imperial. And I've thinned out the web on it, so it's going to behave itself when I make contact with it. There's a little bit of jumping around, but if you pause, sometimes the drill can clean off the chatter and give you the, a good feel for the plunge. The more surface area you get, it's going to go one way or the other. It's going to get really good or bad, but when the chip starts flowing like this on this machine, I just push it and away we go. A pilot hole or a starting spot is probably recommended for a drill that size. And with the boring bar, I'm going to register the boring bar against the face until it just scratches. There you go. Zero out the digital. And I'm going to take the drill point out of the bottom of this hole first. Stepping out about five millimeter, 200 thousandths increments until I'm close enough to take a cleanup cut on the entire bore. And now we have a relatively flat bottom hole. It's still a little bit stepped because of the pitch. Quick check with the scale. Away we go. 200 thousandths. I'm feeding this by hand. I'm not I'm a big fan of feeding things by hand if I'm roughing them out. Leave the machine set to the fine finish. That way when it comes time for the fine finish registration pass, I call that. There's no sense in boring the entire thing out. Stick a caliper on it. Go for a quick check. If it's too hot, by all means, flood it with air, cool it down. And it actually did shrink about a thousandth and a half, believe it or not. Got light pressure on it, so it's not going to distort if I open the jaws. And initial sweep towards center. Clean it out. Plunge to depth, knock the center out, and sweep back to the bore. There you go, nice flat bottom hole. I do have to put a small counter bore in the front of this part. And we are going to make this counter bore just a little bit larger than the diameter of the external thread that we just produced. Since that external thread does not have an undercut, we have to make an allowance so that these two pieces can screw together. Set your threading tool up. And unless you feel like wearing dicum on a lathe, make sure that it's running slowly. I'm going to chamfer the lead of the thread with the threading tool. That way, when I go back in to deburr it, the tool is already set. The tool is upright. I'm cutting on the back of the part. The machine is running in reverse, and I do have a hard stop set, so I will not smash this bar into the bottom of the part. I like to start my internal threads with a resting place for the tool. So each pass starts. There is no load until the tool actually cuts. I am also keeping a very light pressure on the hand wheel, like a drum brake, very mildly engaged. And believe it or not, you can influence the integrity of the thread by changing the pressure on that hand wheel. So whatever you start with, see it through. And deeper to the front one more time. Now anybody that has ever decided to stick their fingers down inside of a moving thread with emery, you better be comfortable with it or the thread better be big enough that it's not going to suck your finger in. When you deburr a thread with emery or scotch brite or steel wool or a wire brush, always do the thread in forward and reverse. Metal will absolutely form fibers as it cuts, little hairs. And if those hairs are deburred in only one direction, you can have a catastrophic failure when you try to fit the mating part in there. They're all fine and dandy until you go to unscrew it, and then they stand up and lock, and it's an uh-oh moment. We are very close to final size. And knowing what the number was on the dial when the bluing showed the witness mark, that is the target spot for the, for the completion of the thread. 
You know, when you get close, don't push it. A class two thread like this probably has about five thousandths worth of clearance. And don't rush it either. If you're going to deburr it in between attempts to make it fit, that is probably a really smart thing to do. I follow everything up with a paper towel and I wrap that actually I poke my finger through the paper towel so that I can feel the root of the thread and make sure it's nice and clean. Take your time. Don't rush it with the test fits. Don't skip a deburring operation in between tries and everything should end up well. Because of the two relief cuts, the counter bore in the cap and the small lead on the plug, that should close. test is when you take it out if it still works on the bench it did good machine is out of gear let's see okay as you can see plunging those threads did not hurt the finish at all they are not torn up like rumor may have it and you can see that there is no relief in the back there's a circular track from where the tool was plunged, but I wouldn't say that counts as a relief. That's more of a just a track where it started. The internal thread is just beautiful as well. Let's see if they go together. I can actually feel the air pushing out of that as I'm closing it. Yep, there you go. It works. One inch, seven ten, twelve thread per inch. Not in the book chart thread. Now, uh, If you were to ever do this and you want to do it with any kind of consistency, the gauge that you'll make to check the ID thread must be several thousands bigger than the pitch diameter that you get on the plug. Okay, That way you know that whatever the plug is, if the plug is from the pitch diameter down and the gauge fits this part, these pieces will go together forever. That's all I got. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you for watching. I am not an advocate of using a mating part or commercial hardware as a gauge ever. But if you're going to control the part, if it's something that is going to never leave your sight and it doesn't have to go to the other side of the world and fit on some tractor for some guy that's been waiting nine weeks for it to be delivered, use the mating part. Otherwise, make a gauge. Hope you found that valuable. Thank you very much for watching. I hope everybody's well. Once again, Joe Pye, Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas.